Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome you all to our worship service here at Tree of Life, and also a special welcome to those who may be worshiping with us online via the internet. Today on the second Sunday of Lent, we are reminded of the perfect obedience of our Savior, which not only sets an example for us to follow, but also enables us to follow. And yet, because of our sins, we recognize how important it is that Jesus sacrificed himself to wash us clean. Our worship will be following the service folder that you have, beginning with our first hymn. May God bless us as we worship him together this morning. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God our Father and ask him in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for forgiveness. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own grievous fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. Forgive us, Lord, for Jesus' sake, for the wrongs we have done against you and against one another. Restore us and let your anger depart from us. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. He gives us life and salvation in our Savior. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. During these days of Lent, let us implore God to give us renewal and his Holy Spirit. 
May we continue to abide in the true faith and at last be received by him through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, our strength, the battle of good and evil rages within and around us, and our ancient foe tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us up again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty and merciful God, you never despise what you have made and always forgive those who turn to you. Create in us such new and contrite hearts that we may truly repent of our sins and obtain your full and gracious pardon through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. First scripture lesson for the second Sunday in Lent is the Old Testament lesson from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. In these verses, we are shown how Abraham, when he was called by God to do something, immediately responded in faith to that call. We too, when called by God, are to respond in faith. We read. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moray at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. This is the word of God. We'll join together in singing our psalm for today, which is Psalm 121, is printed on page 6. <laughs> Of 
second scripture lesson for this Sunday is recorded in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, and then 13 to 17. We're reminded in these verses that Abraham acted in faith, and it was because of his faith that God considered him righteous. It wasn't that Abraham did such good things that God gave him a passing grace. In the same way, it's our faith that God looks for as evident in our lives by what we do. We read from Romans 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value, and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. This is the word of God. Let us join in the verse of the day. Jesus, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. In respect for the gospel, please stand. <coughs> Today's Holy Gospel is recorded in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. It is the story of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. She was reminded that she too, through faith, was a part of God's family, and that Jesus was not only sent to the nation of the Jews, we read. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. Well, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. This is the word of God. 
You may be seated. I invite our children to come forward for a children's message. How are you? How many of you like to play games? What's some of your favorite games to play? You got a favorite game? Princess Candyland. Princess Candyland. Are there rules you have to follow when you play Princess Candyland? Yeah. And if you follow the rules right, what happens in the end? You get to be the winner. What if I told you I was going to change all the rules to the game. Is that a little scary? Yeah. You don't know how to play now, right? <laughs> what if I told you I'm going to change all the rules of the game and you get to win every time? It's not going to be fair to the other person. Okay. <laughs> how about I'm going to change the rules of the game and everybody gets to win every time? Then would you let me change the rules? Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, we're going to talk about a man who was having a very happy life. And then God came and said, I'm going to change all the rules. His name was Abraham. And God was going to tell Abraham, I'm going to change everything about your life. You're going to move. You're going to live with different people. You're going to work in a different place. And I bet that made him a little nervous. He didn't want him to change everything. But then God said, and I'm going to make you a winner. And so we're told, Abraham, listen to God. And we know the story of Abraham. God did a lot of very nice, wonderful things for Abraham. And now Abraham is in heaven because he believed God. And you know what? God also said to you, I'm going to change your life. See, we started out in Satan's family. And in Satan's family, we weren't going to go to heaven. But God said, I'm going to change everything for you. And he gave us Jesus to die on the cross. And he says, now all of you are going to be winners. In the end, you all get to go to heaven. So because it's God telling us that, we listen to him. And we let him make the rules for our life. Because we know that following his rules, listening to his word and his promises... We win. We get to go to heaven. So we're thankful that, that God changed our life and brought us into his family. So we should say a prayer to God and thank him for doing that, shouldn't we? Let's hold our hands and bow our heads. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have made us part of your family by believing that Jesus is our Savior. Keep us always in your family so that one day... When we leave our life here on earth, we can be winners with you in heaven. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You can go back to your seats. And we'll continue with our next hymn. Salty. 
Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The word of God for our consideration on this second Sunday in Lent is from the Old Testament lesson, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. We heard it earlier. I'm just going to focus on two verses. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him. This is God's word. You may be seated. In the name of our dear Savior Jesus, who sacrificed himself so that we could have eternal life, dear friends in Christ. I believe that to some degree or another, we all like to have certain patterns and routines in our life. You probably have a, a routine for when you get up in the morning. You know where your razor is and you know that the coffee will be waiting when you're done. If you have children, you probably have a routine for getting them up in the morning and getting them ready for school and fixing breakfast for them. You have a routine for getting to school and then on to work, and at work you probably have some more patterns and routines. Those patterns and routines make us feel comfortable. We, we know what's coming. We know what to expect. It takes a lot of the uncertainty out of life. Well, what if one day after becoming quite comfortable in the patterns you have for yourself, somebody came and said, I'm going to change everything about your life. I'm going to take all of those patterns and routines and throw them out. We're going to do everything completely different. Well, if you can put yourself into that mental scenario, you might begin to understand how Abraham may have felt when God appeared to him and said, Abraham, I'm going to change everything. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household. God called Abraham to change everything, to remove himself from the comfortable patterns that he had established, the comfortable surroundings in which he was living, the people that he knew. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. And in the words of our text, we're told, so Abraham left. No questions. No arguing, no hesitation. He just did what he was told. Do you think if someone actually came into your life and said, I'm going to change everything, you would be as accepting as Abraham was? <clears throat> Maybe you can understand Abraham's position a little bit. But we know that Abraham listened to God's call to him. And we know that he immediately responded in obedience to that call. And so we want to use this story of Abraham to teach a lesson for ourselves today. We might not receive the same call from God. I don't expect anyone suddenly to tell you to change everything, but you have received some calls from God. And through the example of Abraham, we need to realize that God wants us to listen and God wants us to respond. Our text says, The Lord had said to Abram, 
Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land that I will show you. Well, now by this time in his life, Abraham was 75 years old. He had a family. He had friends. He had a very successful business life. He was blessed with many herds and flocks. He had servants. He was comfortable in Haran where he lived. And then the Lord, in one way or another, spoke to him and said, leave everything. But didn't tell him exactly where he was going. He did, however, attach a promise to his command. He said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed by you. Abraham, change everything. Leave your comfortable patterns and routines. And if you do, I am going to bless you. I'm going to make your name, your reputation well known. 4,000 years later, we know who Abraham is. I will bless others through you. I will bless those who bless you. I will protect you by cursing those who curse you. And then perhaps most importantly, he said, I will bless all nations through you. But in order for all that to happen, you need to pick up everything and go. Sometimes the commands that come to us from God don't really seem that logical. If we're going to look at things from a purely human point of view, why couldn't God do those things where Abraham was? Why did Noah have to build a great big boat in the middle of dry land? If Noah were to look at his past experiences, he would have said, we don't need a great big boat in the middle of dry land. There haven't been any torrential rains in my lifetime. There doesn't seem to be any reason for me to build a great big boat in the middle of dry land. But God told me to build a great big boat in the middle of dry land, and so Noah did. And 120 years later, the flood came and destroyed every other living human being except Noah his wife, his three sons, and their three wives, because he listened to God. Remember the story of Gideon going to battle against the Midianites? He had his army of thousands, seemed well prepared, and then God spoke to him and said, what? You got too many people. But it's the Midianites. They're strong. They're powerful. They're good militarily. But God said, no, let's whittle down those soldiers and ended up with 300 and then he said, now equip them for the battle with what? Some lanterns and trumpets against the Midianites. But Gideon listened. And in the middle of the night, they blew their trumpets and they broke the lanterns and held them up. And the Midianites became so confused that they destroyed each other. And because Gideon listened, things turned out well. What about the story of the children of Israel moving into the promised land? Remember, the spies came back and said, there are Nevi'im in the land, there's, there's giants. We can never do it. So God sent them back in the wilderness for 40 years and a new generation of Israelites came and they crossed the Jordan and they came to Jericho and God said, I've got a military plan so we can conquer Jericho. And remember what it was? For six days, march around the city quietly. On the seventh day, march around it seven times and blow your trumpets. That's probably the worst military strategy I've ever heard of in my life. And yet, when the children of Israel listened, the walls fell down and God gave them the city. What about Jonah? I need you to go do some mission work, Jonah. And Jonah's probably perked up his ears. There's lots of, there's lots of prime spots with people who are just waiting to hear about the word of God. And God says, go to Nineveh. That wicked city, that immoral city, that city that doesn't treat missionaries well? Uh, Jonah said, I'm not going to listen to you, God. And got on a boat and went the other way. And then during a storm, the lot was cast and Jonah said, throw me over, I'm the problem. And he spent three days in the belly of the large fish, which deposited him on the shore. And then God said, Jonah, I'm going to talk to you again. I want you to go to Nineveh. And so Jonah said, all right, I'll go to Nineveh. And he preached throughout the city. And what happened? The Ninevites listened. Sometimes God's commands don't sound so logical or seem to make much common sense. God tells us, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Saved from what? I'm pretty safe and secure and healthy. 
Saved from sin. Well, what's sin? Sin is when you disobey me. Well, who are you? I'm the God of heaven. Have you ever seen him? Have you ever seen heaven? How do you know you can't take what belongs to your neighbors? Lots of people do and nothing seems to happen to them. People use filthy language and they seem to be doing well. But God says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and obey these commands that I give you. Many people in the world ignore God's commands and they seem to be doing okay. Why should we listen? Well, why should Abraham suddenly pick up and move when everything seemed to be going well for him? Because God said so. And when God says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, and he teaches us through the law that there are rules which he has set, and that we've broken them and committed what he calls sins, and that sins will send you to hell unless they're paid for, but Jesus paid for them, we listen to God because that's what he says to us. And when he says, now out of thankfulness, here's some rules I want you to follow to show me your gratitude, we listen to God and we live our life differently perhaps than others in the world. And we don't really look at the, the outcome of our earthly efforts and compare them and say this worked and this didn't. We say this is what God said to do. Abraham picked up and left, took his family and his possessions and his servants with him. And we says, our text says he arrived there. God got him where God said he was going to lead him. And there we are told that Abraham, because of his faith, believed what God was telling him to do was the right thing for him, and he responded in faith. The writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament said, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. You see, Abraham knew who it was that had called him to go. Moses said it was the Lord. And he used that, that name for God that can only rightly be used for God. It's in your Old Testament, the capital L-O-R-D. It's Jehovah. That's the one the children of Israel didn't even try to pronounce because of reverence for it. They didn't want to mispronounce it and make a mockery of God. So whenever we see L-O-R-D in the Old Testament, there's a special meaning attached to it. It's talking about the love and faithfulness of God. The, the God who created the world and in love put it together in such a miraculous and wonderful way. Scientifically, we're still learning about it and figuring it out, and we've only begun to scratch the surface. But he made the world and everything in it and then made us the crown of his creation. And when we sinned against him, instead of destroying us like he could have, he made a wonderful promise to send a savior, his own son, who would take our punishment, that's the one who came to Abraham and said, I, I want you to do something. I want you to leave. And because it was the Lord, Abraham packed up and left. Well, sometimes when, when we're faced with decisions, do you ever sit down and take out a piece of paper and, and draw a line down the middle and you, you write the reasons for and the reasons against? What if Abraham had done that? Reasons for leaving. God said so. Reasons for staying. I got a good family here. I got friends. I'm, I'm successful in business. It's a lot of stuff to pack up and move. I don't even know where I'm going. The list would have went on and on. And humanly speaking, Abraham would have said, no, I'm staying here. But on the other side, reasons for was the Lord said to do this. That outweighs anything. In our world, too, there are so many times when we have decisions to make, and we can look at all the earthly logic and common sense and say, this is what I should do. You know, tell a few lies and spread some gossip at work because that's how you get the promotion. Or fudge on your 1040 a little bit and save a little extra money. That, that's what everyone else is doing. But the Lord says to follow me. The Lord says to obey my commands. And that's the lesson we learned from Abraham. Abraham did what the Lord said, and the Lord led him to the place he wanted to lead him. And the Lord fulfilled all of those seven-point promises. Abraham became a great nation. His name became well-known, still is today. People were blessed through him. People that stood up against him, God protected him from. And finally, through Abraham, all nations on earth have been blessed. 
through Abraham came the promised Messiah, and through that promised Messiah, people of all nations are being saved for eternal life in heaven. In faith to God's call, Abraham responded. And why is that? Because along with God's call comes the power that enables us to do what God wants us to do. We don't look at ourselves and say, I'll try harder and I'll be better. We've made the mess that we're in trying harder and being better. We look to God and we say, God, enable me to respond to your call. He says, here's my word, which gives you the strength. Here's my sacrament, which gives you the strength. Cooperate with me now in enabling yourself. Use the tools I've given you so that you can do what I ask you to do. And as we do that, we bring glory and honor to our God. When Abraham went to the land of Canaan, remember this was a land of heathen people, unbelievers, we're told that he there built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. It's another Old Testament phrase that's pretty familiar, calling on the name of the Lord. It meant he had a public worship service. It meant he told people about Jesus, about the Messiah. You know, when they saw this guy with a large family and herds and flocks coming into their territory, they probably asked some questions. Who are you? What are you doing here? And Abraham said, I'm Abraham from Haran. My God sent me here. Well, why did your God send you here? Because he was going to bless me here. Well, who's this God? And Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Let me tell you about my God. And through Abraham's witness, both by his words and his lifestyle, people were led to the Lord. And that message of God's promise was passed on through Abraham's family, which became a great nation. And finally, some 2,000 years later, Jesus was sent into the manger of Bethlehem, and through him all nations on earth have been blessed. Abraham listened and obeyed. God was glorified, and Abraham received the benefits of listening to God. So what's the lesson for us? Don't just listen to God, but obey him. Respond to him. And the method for doing that is by using the tools that enable you to do that. Come to church regularly where God's word is used faithfully. Make sure that your pastor and your congregation continue to preach the word faithfully. Hold them accountable. Receive the sacrament through which God says your sins will be forgiven and the Holy Spirit will strengthen your faith. And then go out into your life and respond to the call that God has given you to be an example for others in life. Be the light. Be the salt. Share your faith with others. Take those opportunities that God gives you by placing you into a, a world of sin by putting you in situations where you interact with unbelievers or perhaps Christians who need some strengthening and encouraging. First of all, start with your families. Share your faith with them so that you may be a blessing to them. Then look at the other opportunities God gives you in your life to witness to people by your life and by your words to share with them that wonderful message that Jesus is their Savior too but all of this to a God that we've never seen? Remember, Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. God gives us the confidence we need to be sure that he really exists and that he can keep his promises. He's given us so many examples throughout the pages of Scripture, and Abraham today is the example before us. When you listen to God and you respond, God is glorified, and you are blessed. And who of us doesn't want to be blessed by God? So take the opportunities you have, not just for an hour on Sunday, but with your Bibles at home, your meditations, booklets. You can even have a daily devotion sent to you through email from our synod every, every day. Let God's word speak to you. Listen to what God is calling you to do, to believe in Jesus as your Savior, and to live your life in glory because of what he has done for you. And then watch how God blesses you. May the Lord continue to speak to us through his word. May the Lord continue to enable us to listen and respond. And may the Lord bless and keep us now and forever. Amen. And now that peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Having heard the word of God, let's stand and confess our faith in the Lord. We use today the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated as our offerings are gathered. We stand for prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, because of our sins, we justly deserve to suffer both your curse during our time on earth and your condemnation eternally in hell. But we plead for your mercy, because your Son Jesus suffered the punishment our sins deserve. For his sake you have forgiven our sins and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Now trusting that he will intercede for us, we dare to ask for your blessing. Mercifully provide whatever each of us may need for body and life. Protect us and those we love from all harm and danger. Maintain good government among us and bless all those in authority with wisdom and integrity. Defend us from the devil and the world, which would lure us back into the way that leads to eternal death. Destroy in us the desires that are contrary to your will. Comfort the persecuted, the depressed, the sick, and the dying with the assurance that nothing can separate us from your love. Finally, strengthen our faith by the word of your forgiveness and by the sacrament of our Savior's own body and blood. Grant that we may praise you, our merciful God, by showing mercy to others in all their needs. We ask this in the name of our Savior, and in his name we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. 
We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it to his disciples saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always for the sacrament of the altar as you are directed by our usher. Take a knee. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the remission of all of your sins. Now may this true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which he gave into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which he gave into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior given into death for the forgiveness of your sins. of all of your sins. Take a drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
This is the blood of your Savior. For the remission of all of your sins. Take a drink. Take a drink. The true blood of our Lord and Savior. The true blood of your Savior shed for your sins. Take a drink. This is the true blood of your Savior shed for your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Savior strengthen you and keep you in true faith unto life everlasting. If your sins are forgiven, you can depart in peace. Amen. body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which he gave unto death for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which he gave unto death for the forgiveness of your sins. Take a drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Amen. shed on the cross for the remission of May this, the true body and blood of our Savior, strengthen you and keep you in true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. You can depart in peace. Amen. Savior Jesus Christ, which he gave into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which he gave into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the remission of all of your sins. This is the true blood of your Savior, which he shed on the cross for your sins. May this true body and blood of our Savior strengthen you and keep you in true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. You can depart in peace. Amen. is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for your sins. And take drink. This is the true blood of your Savior 
which he shed on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Savior shed for your sins. May this true body and blood of our Savior strengthen you and keep you in true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. You can depart in peace. Amen. Please stand and we'll join in the thanksgiving beginning with the song of Simeon. which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we close with our final hymn. Again, good morning. morning. Just a couple brief announcements for you. A reminder that we continue our midweek Lenten services on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. 
Uh, Pastor Glendy from Fayetteville will be leading you in worship. I'll be over at uh, Gethsemane, and Pastor Keeker will be in Fayetteville. So we hope that many of you can take advantage of that opportunity. Following our service, I'd like to meet with our confirmation students and their parents just to discuss our scheduling, see if there's a, a better time than after church on Sunday, and if not, we'll, uh, we'll talk about what to do with it. So, parents, uh, let's just meet in the back of the church here after everyone is dismissed. Are there any other announcements anyone would like to make? Yes, sir. Just real quick, I sent out an email on the next men's Bible study. If you didn't get the email, let me know, because every once in a while, our list sort of doesn't work right. But uh, uh, please respond back if you plan on doing it that way. We can get a head count for who's coming, and there is a, uh, a book that you need to purchase, either an e-book or a hard copy book. So if you have any questions, look me up. But respond back to the email. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Anybody else with announcements today? Yes, ma'am. And also just remember that there's a Lenten dinner before the service. Huh? Lenten dinner at 6? All right. Lenten dinner. There is a sign-up sheet for that out there. There is a sign-up sheet. All right. Over the next couple of months, hopefully, I would like to get to uh, meet all of you personally. And in order to do that, um, I'm going to each week put out a schedule that you can sign up for when you would like to meet with me, either in your homes or if you prefer here at church, I can do that as well. Uh, this gives me a better opportunity to get to know you and to be a better pastor to you. Uh, there are morning, afternoon, and evening openings. If you happen to know that somebody who signed up in the morning lives way out there and you live way over there, please help me out. But uh, if your address is correct in the latest membership directory, you can just put a check mark or something. But if it's different or wrong, please fill in your address and, and give me a phone number as well. Um, that sheet is on the table in the fellowship hall. So each week there will be a new schedule for you to sign up. You don't all have to rush to do it at once, but if you see some openings and that time slot works for you, uh, feel free to put your name in there. Good to see you all again today, and I might see some of you during the week, but if not, we sure hope to see you all again next Sunday. We'll reserve seats for you. <laughs> Thank you.